They met in a stairwell. Doug was in network security. John was a high school kid in a hoodie hacking his way into an access point. The new company they went on to co-found years later, Duo Security, was acquired by Cisco in 2018 for $2.35 billion. In this Q&A, re-engineering radio's Josh Walker and guest Colin Barris ask the founders what's next and does it stay in Ann Arbor. Re-engineering radio is brought to you by University of Michigan Engineering, where we challenge the status quo to serve the common good. Colin has the first question. Well, um... Right at the top, we want to say congratulations to both of you and to Duo Security. Obviously, um, it's Thank like um, a major achievement to take a company from modest means to multi-billion dollar status in um, under a decade. I mean, that's just incredible. Um, so at this moment in time, with the acquisition by Cisco, do you see that as a moment to celebrate? Or is, the, is it a bit bittersweet because you lose a bit of the control? Where are you right now? I think it's a... It's a celebration. This is John Overhide, CTO and co-founder of Duo Security. It has been a, a big build to get to this milestone, but um, at the same time, you know, uh, the deal is officially closed now. We're part of Cisco, and, and we're just continuing to operate the same way that we did before Cisco. So I think for especially a lot of the, the employee base, it's still business as usual, and we're still you know, continuing on our, our plans that we had um, even before Cisco approached us, which is why we wanted to come on board with Cisco because they can not only help us keep doing what we do really well, but also you know accelerate our growth and allow us to reach more organizations. Yeah, I, mean, <clears throat> I guess uh, you know it doesn't feel like it's been uh, under a decade. It feels like it's been uh, dog years, or whatever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is Duo Security's CEO and co-founder Doug Song. Yeah, I feel like I've had 50 years of my life. <laughs> but you know, yeah, yeah, I think it's it is a, it's a, it's a, uh, an opportunity for us to celebrate. But you know, I, I do think you know, yeah, very frankly, you know, there, there's a it is a shift, right? It is a shift of us becoming part of a larger organization that, that is exciting. And you know, what's you know, I think most exciting about it is that it is an organization that's been aligned to the journey that we've been on, uh, becoming part of theirs, right? Uh, we are, you know, we were built to basically help protect organizations of all sizes, um, of any kind, um, from, from you know, all the digital threats, right, that they are exposed to today. And, um, and Cisco has, has worked so hard to connect the world, you know, I mean, they are the network, basically. Um, you know, making sure that they, they can help their customers do so safely and that uh, we can actually help leverage that, you know, leverage that giant platform, right, um, for, to do what we want. We always wanted to do at scale faster. That's, that's really, the, uh, I think, the, the biggest, most exciting sort of uh, challenge before us now. So it's, uh, <laughs> we, we have this uh, huge platform in which we can um, yeah. you know, grow this, uh, grow, you know, deliver our mission from. And that's, that's probably the biggest difference. But you can but, think about it like Duo's always grown at an exponential rate in terms of like, you know, team or customers or, or revenue or impact in the, the security market. <clears throat> and Cisco actually allows us to continue that kind of exponential trajectory. Like yeah. that's, it's almost, um, it's almost the this, this same amount of growth and change that you know, we hope to expect with Cisco as we have seen on a, a you know, year by year basis right, at right, Duo. Yeah, yeah because um, just a, a casual observer like me might think that you lose a lot by this, but yeah. actually you said you gain more than you lose by, yeah. by becoming part of this bigger. Entity. Yeah, and, and, and you know, there, there's always, you know, there, also, there always is an emotional impact because you know, we, we, we've, you know, we've kind of, as I told the team, we've kind of skipped steps one and two here. You know, we, we were, you know, a company that was on route to becoming a public company, and now we are, right? <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. In a much faster time frame, at a much larger scale, much more quickly than I think any of us ever would have uh, been prepared to do. Um, and, and yes, you know, there's an emotional impact of us, um, you know, having different colors, right? Like, you know, but it's like, um, you know, Cisco blue versus duo green. That all said, uh, you know, it's kind of like graduating U of M, right? Like once a Wolverine, always a Wolverine. And I think, you know, we all go on to do great and bigger things, right? Post our college careers, right? And it feels a little bit like that. Like the duo has kind of graduated into this you know, massive... <laughs> Sort of opportunity together. Um, I'm sure, there's some bad sports analogies like yeah. LeBron <laughs> going to go win some championships in LA. Or yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Uh, so, 
even before Duo, even before Arbor Networks, even before Sio Security, um, you both seem to have a pretty... Sio was Duo, by the way, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, really bad at naming companies. Arbor, Sio, I mean, it's the hardest thing in computer science, isn't it? Other than caching? Mm -hmm. <laughs> our, our reasoning was like, Let's just like look at a map and pick a pick something and actually get started on the company versus spending uh, spending a long time yeah. naming it. We, we were eventually consistent. Yeah. <laughs> Distributed so even, systems jokes. Even before all that, um, you both seem to have a pretty strong security focus. Um, and so why why has security been your passion for so long? Um, uh, and what's what's the drive here to benefit people in this way? Can I go first? Sure. Well, I mean, I, <clears throat> I don't know about John, but I'm not, I'm not really very good at anything else. And so <laughs> it's kind of all I know how to do. Um, I've been doing it since I was really little, you know. So, you know, ever since I was on computers, you know, half my interest in computers was, uh, was security. Um, <clears throat> but part of it is I grew up in the shadow of the NSA, like most of my neighbors, third of my neighbors all worked for the agency. Um, we were in a bedroom community of the agency. so. All the BBSs, predating the internet, all the BBS and all the stuff that I, how I got into computers was basically on these built-in board systems where we were all talking and learning about security from each other. Um, so for me, it's just always been part of what uh, I've enjoyed doing. Um, part of it's also I just like the culture of it. Um, so somewhat, you know, the popular culture of security is a little countercultural, and uh, and most of my hobbies tend to be. Uh, uh, somewhat transgressive, you know. Um, growing up is either you know punk rock, graffiti, skateboarding, or hacking. So, <laughs> I don't know, John. Yeah, I mean it's the same for me. I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that, in in some ways, I'm I'm fortunate that you know cybersecurity is like a geopolitical problem now, and there's you know uh, just massive growing industry around it because I feel the same way. Like that's what I always knew I wanted to do, and if computers didn't exist, I'd probably be doing something in physical security or a lock pick or something that, um, the thing that excites me and got me interested in computer security is understanding how systems work and then understanding how the people who designed those systems didn't think about uh, potential flaws or uh, potential design decisions and showing ways, ways around those. So it really is a kind of subversive curiosity to poke holes in, in systems or in processes in order to, to find vulnerability. And um, you know, I think that that natural curiosity is what drives a lot of people in our into our space, and also drives their success, you know, in in the security space. And uh, we like to apply some of those same uh, same principles to, to business of doing things differently, thinking subversively of like the path of success that no one else has taken. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I was just fortunate as a, an individual to know through school, through my early stage of my career, like this is always. I knew what I wanted to do since I was in middle school. I knew I was going to go to computer security, and you know, I, I had a, a business in, in high school. I, I started, so I always knew I wanted to, to build a, a company and do something entrepreneurial. Um, and so, an ISP, right? Yeah, a web hosting company called Focal Host. Had another name too, but <laughs> we'll talk about that one. Just on that, I, it's, it's still Googleable. It's okay. FYI. I'm sure. Yeah, a Wayback Machine has it. Yeah. But, but, that, but, um, oh, no, sorry, oh, but, but but also, you know, to touch on your, your, the, the latter half of your question, like why we felt like it's you know meaningful to, to apply our skills to help, right? Is it because um, you know there's all the there's all that side of it which is like our personal interest, right? That is, uh, I call computer security sort of a super creative sort of uh, field because. Um, you know, more than just creative, because uh, when John says, you know, it's studying systems, understand how they work, and how the designers might have thought about them, uh, it actually goes even beyond that. It's understanding the systems even better than the creators yeah. understood them. Because so much of security, particularly if you're doing like a lot of stuff that Jono had done, and I'd done earlier, exploit development and so forth, it's about writing to these unpublished APIs that programs present. Um, and as other folks have said, like programming the weird machine, right? Like there's you know, there's, there's, intent, there's intended <coughs> states that, you know, designers didn't think of and you're kind of discovering them. So it's a, it is a really kind of deep exploration of the systems around us. Yeah, so whether, whether it's strictly subversive or just creative misuse, I think there's something really, truly super creative about kind of what people do in security. But in terms of, you know, how, how we apply that to, uh, again, sort of, I think, a very fundamental and human need to, uh, to be part of a community, right, and, and, and to serve, right? You know, that's one thing I think we're, you know, as John says, it's, it's sort of a lucky thing for us both that, you know, uh, 
that there's actually opportunities to make money doing what we do and, and, and being helpful, right? It's actually a valuable skill set now, um, helping defend others uh, from harm. It went from like a kind of like underground scene where um, in, in a lot of ways people were genuinely curious and they wanted to share information and they wanted to um, you know, deeply investigate um, these, these early you know, computing systems and networks. And that as those computing systems and networks infiltrated you know, our, our daily lives and our, our corporate lives, suddenly security be became a, you know, a critical thing, not only for every business, but every individual out there. And that's, that's certainly a trend that you know, we all know will continue as, as everything becomes digitized. And with that follows the, the security risks, the concern. Um, and uh, you know, starting Duo was, was our way of saying that like, every organization deserves proper security how can we both build a successful you know, commercial business to go tackle this problem, but how can we really reach um, organizations of all shapes and sizes who need to not only survive in a digitized age, but they need to be able to you know, embrace new technologies in a safe way. Right. Um, just picking up on something you said a little while ago about that, uh, that, that natural curiosity um, reminded me of just reading about the story of how you two actually met in the first place, which could you just give us a little history of that? Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I had a, a company in, in high school that did web hosting, and we, we did some you know, online marketing, um, some, some email campaigns, I'll put it that way. Euphemistic. Yes, yeah. and uh, <laughs> we, would, we would drive to Ann Arbor and um, sit at Starbucks and um, use the Wi-Fi to you know, sip on some coffee, talk business, and send <laughs> out our email campaigns. And uh, I, uh, there, at one point there was a... Uh, Wi-Fi access point. This was like late, like '99 or early 2000, maybe, mm -hmm. when Arbor Networks was um, starting out, spun out of the university, and we saw the Arbor Networks Wi-Fi access point. We said, "Hey, let's go, let's go get on there and poke around and see if we can find any interesting systems." And uh, we couldn't get a good signal, so we crept up the back stairwell of the Starbucks building, and uh, we're trying to get a, a stronger connection. And uh, Doug walks out of the door and so we're like high school hackers probably in hoodies crouched with our laptops in the stairwell and um, we're like oh my gosh that's Doug we know Doug because of some network security tooling um, like DSNF that, that he had written and his involvement in the open source community of course had heard of Arbor and uh, he kind of gave us a little sideways glance and <laughs> walked past us um, so that was the first time we we unofficially met um, and then you know we we ended up getting involved in um, you know, just some, some security projects together, and I had interned at Arbor a couple times, and Ann Arbor's a pretty small town, so um, when I came here for school, uh, certainly being involved in the security community was, was pretty easy. Um, it was a pretty small community, and uh, yeah, that's how we, we first got to know each other, and uh, <clears throat> then, you know, fast forward several years, of just kind of figuring out the right time that both our professional lives uh, sort of aligned to, to start the company together. Well, you know, ha ha hackers trade in information, right? And so when hackers meet, they always already know. Like, when they meet for the first time, they're not really meeting for the first time. They already know a bunch of stuff <laughs> typically about each other. And so that was one of the, you know, that, that first episode was kind of a confirmation for me that John was, uh, you know, interesting and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, bright hacker. Because uh, actually that, that Wi-Fi network he was on was actually our, our honeypot network. We had set up that uh, kind of a false uh, wireless network outside of Arbor to catch anybody that might be interesting at the edge of campus, you know, poking around. You caught me. Yeah, that's certainly what I did <laughs> when I was yeah. in school. Um, and so, uh, although there wasn't wireless at the time. <laughs> and so, at any rate, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was for we were fortunate, right, that, uh, you know, John kind of found that kind of Trap, but then we we also had flown a uh, that office had flown a, uh, a Jolly Roger, trying to you know uh, flag out of, uh, you know it was at the corner the Starbucks at the corner of uh, State and Liberty, and so it was just pretty awesome. You know, we were flying like this you know pirate flag you know, overlooking campus. Um, so in, in, in a number of ways, we were trying to send out a little bit of a, of a beacon right yeah. to uh, some of the I want to say maladjusted but maybe more creative uh, <laughs> sort of folks to, to come find us. <clears throat> Right. And can we just ask um, another quick question about where you've come from? Uh, and this actually relates back to what you talked about, uh, uh, the way that this community has been, you know, we go back maybe 15, 20 years. It's an underground community. Maybe uh, people in the mainstream like us, wouldn't necessarily see the benefit. So there's this story of you, 
helping out when you're at, when you're a student at University of Michigan, mm -hmm. so saying, hey, you know, I found flaws in your security, um, and you're doing that in a in a you know tapping them on the shoulder and saying, fix this, you yeah. know. But the reaction was hostile. I mean, ca uh, well, first of all, yeah, <clears throat> is that true? And and can you kind of understand how the attitudes at that point? led to that hostility and how things might have changed now. I think in, in you know, in the earlier days yeah, that was a, a common reaction just in security generally, people discovering issues or vulnerabilities, informing someone and having that reaction of like, why did you do this? Why did you look for this? You know, why are you publishing this? Um, well, it, it's kind of grown <laughs> up with, with the industry, yeah, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. you know, be before there were really very many boundaries to networks, right? You know, hackers could sort of explore sort of freely, and, and, and no one really thought twice about it, right? Before the World Wide Web, it was sort of like X25 just existed, and you didn't need more than a modem, right, to be able to <laughs> find your way to different things. But I think the, you know, society sort of learned kind of along the way kind of how to, how to think about this stuff. And it's, and it's kind of swung from being very, very reactionary to a little bit more nuanced, um, and maybe now back to sort of drawing harder lines. But um, you know, now, it, now people get paid to report vulnerabilities, so companies <coughs> will set up programs to invite people to come hack their systems and, and pay them for it. So it's you know it, it it varies, but you know I think the 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 reaction is that organizations are embracing that that free research that you know people are providing to them. Yeah, like for, for instance, you know, as an example of sort of the, the, that cultural shift that's happened in the large, but maybe just looking at an example even on campus, you know, when I was a freshman, and this is a, strangely a story that was recounted um, as I was uh, speaking at President Schlissel's um, uh, first president's luncheon of this year, you know, so he organized this kind of thing with a bunch of UVM supporters, um, but he starts off by talk, telling about how the story of uh, how I ended up getting, I was caught hacking, you know, <laughs> um, and we'll leave it at that, and, you know, at any rate, um, but, but end up working for the university, right, um, on academic preparation for four years, but, you know, <laughs> working for the university um, to do security. Um, but, you know, similarly, like John, John had found a ton of stuff, you know, a it's lot just, of It's just natural. It's, you know, we're, we're in an environment, and we're in a computing environment, and we're exploring the systems around us, not only because of our own interests, but because they contain our own personal information that we want to make sure is, is protected. Yeah. In fact, you know, I mean, you, you, truly, you know, the computer, the computer aided engineering network on campus was the reason I came to Michigan. Like, I didn't, I didn't apply to any schools outside the East Coast. Michigan was com completely a fluke. I, I didn't know anything about the school except its networks, and that's what, <clears throat> you know, there were very few places in in, in the world at the time that had uh, the diversity of all the different things it had, from the Apollos to the you know, AIX machines, IRIX machines, Solaris machines, um, the Craze, the IBM, you know, mainframes and the, you know, Center for Parallel Computing. Like, it had, you know, a network that looked like NASA Ames. Um, and that, that, that is amazing, right? U of M has done so much, right, in, that, in this area. Um, Michigan has done so much. And um, I think we, uh, you know, it, it's given us so much, right? Because of that history of, of Michigan's investment in building out <clears throat> that kind of, 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 of environment, learning environment, right, for its students. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that we, we've been able to produce just, and can contribute so much, right, to the, to the you know, uh, yeah, the success of the internet in so many ways. I think you see that same kind of, you know, subversive culture still alive at, at um, the computer science department, like the hot tub that was placed on the roof uh, a couple years ago, and some of those same kind of you know MIT hacks that are, are done frequently on that campus, um, you know that that spirit still still lives on in Michigan. We'll be right back in twenty seconds. Just wanted to know if you like the podcast so far. This is a new medium for University of Michigan engineering crew, so if you have any ideas or feedback, please email engineeringpod at umich.edu. Engineeringpod at umich.edu. Uh, so, John, you um, you have a PhD, and you you have some comments about being an academic 
Right. Um, so why? <laughs> it's not for everybody. <laughs> right. So why did you? I love you, them though. <laughs> I love, I love you, man. I got it. We all got it. <laughs> um, uh, so I mean, you had the skills after your undergraduate work, right, to go out into the industry, but you went and got this PhD. So um, why did you do that? Well, you did it concurrently, actually. Yeah, you know, I, I had a, you know, I'd spent, um, I'd worked at U of M, um, you know, similar kind of maybe atoning for some of our, our sins um, at the university. Um, had also worked at Merit Networks, which has a, you know, incredibly rich history of, um, of networking in the early stage of the internet. Um, and I worked at Arbor. And, uh, um, you know, I, I had this, this uh, decision to make, um, I think when I was a, a senior and getting ready to graduate, of do I go into grad school and um, pursue a, a PhD under uh, Farnam Jahani, who was my advisor and the um, chair of the department, or do I go work for Arbor for Farnham, who is the C CEO and chair of Arbor? So it was very, uh, either way, I was going to be working <coughs> with or for uh, Farnham in some way and with or for you know, Doug and the other Arbor network researchers. Um, but I, um, I did end up deciding to. Um, to stay at the, the university and pursue that program, um, partially because that's what I, I loved doing research. Maybe not so much in the traditional academic way, but I had just such broad interests um, to, to explore in all areas of, of computer security. So in some ways it was the exact wrong way to do a thesis in that you do a ton of stuff versus focusing on like you know, one sliver that you're- I feel like it's worked out for you. It, it, worked, <laughs> it worked out okay, but that was the, the best environment that allowed me to, to actually grow my career um, grow my personal brand, uh, get to do the research that I thought was um, interesting to me, but also important to the, um, you know, to the the world, and the university, particularly um, that research group and some of the adjacent um, research groups, turned into more of a like a startup incubator than a program that would churn out faculty, and so that's where you know we saw the the Arbor folks like uh, Craig Labovitz and Rob Mallon spin out um, Arbor Networks um, in the early 2000s. Uh, a lot of my colleagues, uh, Shushant, who was an <coughs> expert in anti-spam cybersecurity, ended up building an Indian law search engine. <laughs> was that, you know, when, he, when he finished his PhD. Uh, my, my closest colleague, Evan Cook, uh, was an expert in like, early botnet cybersecurity research and said, well, I finished my thesis. I'm going to go start a telephony company in the Bay Area, which turned into to Twilio with some other U of M co-founders, which I told him was a terrible idea. That's worked out even, even better for him. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of the, the orientation of the program, was like explore, um, explore deep topics, but do it in a very real and practical way. And a lot of that, um, that, that guidance from, from Farnham and that research group is what kind of resulted in people actually starting companies that were solving practical problems um, and not necessarily the, the other kind of like tenure track for faculty that um, often happens after a, a PhD. So like I, I loved my experience at, at U of M. I always tell prospects the pros and cons um, because it, it really is not for, for everybody. And um, yeah, it, it, did, it did work out pretty well. Yeah. Um, just bu building on what you just said, if we go back to 2009, 2010, when mm -hmm. you're actually beginning to found Duo, and, and this is where you're going to be moving on to, um, this, you know, this is going to be the next big period of your life. Um, it seems really important for you, uh, for the success of that company, that it wasn't just um, in isolation, in a vacuum. It, it, it's tied into this this big community, which evidently involves U of M as well, the, um, you know, incubating and, and sending people uh, that way and, and you know that um, the way that you can bounce ideas off each other feed mm -hmm. off each other I mean it, has that been a basically without that would Geo have been as successful well no as it <clears throat> yeah but, but I think it ha hackers generally are network thinkers yeah. right and so and I think again yeah, if you think about U of M's place in the world it's the hub of a, of a giant network right we have the world's largest living alumni association um, there's not a lot else you know, sort of in, in Arbor, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, but it, so it's kind of the crossroads of just a, a ton of brains and talent that finds its way here and then, uh, you know, most often heads back out, but creates kind of a, uh, a massive, um, you know, sort of opportunity for folks in that network. 
um, to, to draw upon. And so I think when we, I mean, we, we, you know, we can never connect the dots looking forward, right? It's always almost in retrospect that you ever do. But in so many ways, you know, the, the, it's the platform that U of M kind of represents here that uh, it's a lot of the formula for our success, right? The fact that, you know, <clears throat> at U of M, there's sort of, uh, unlike any other university, maybe Berkeley's the closest, but U of M has, what, like 100 of something, right? different departments in their respective top 10. Um, there is a uniform excellence, right, um, across, uh, you know, the, the, that, this community that um, you'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere else. And even places like Berkeley, they don't have a med school, they don't have a hospital. Um, and so U of M really is, you know, scaled very differently. And uh, that commitment towards excellence, in, in one way in particular, I think, uh, has been very important for us, which is uh, U of M's focus on interdis interdisciplinary research. And, and, and kind of engagement, right, with, with the broader community. Because uh, from where we sit in Michigan, right, we have to do that, right? U of M, ha in order to be successful, it has to sort of uh, be a global sort of entity in its, uh, its ambition and scope. And so, like, when, when, you know, <clears throat> within John's kind of, you know, scope of, of his career and research, right, uh, at the university, you know, the fact that he did work on so many different things, right, was a large part of, you know, kind of, um, you know, for, for a guy who went and, and, you know, did stuff that was, uh, I want to say somewhat theoretical, but you know, pr pretty, pretty esoteric and pretty focused kind of um, work all the way to stuff that was like, hey, I'm going to go just, gonna just break a bunch of security products, <laughs> you know, <laughs> super tactical, um, uh, super practical, um, and super insightful, and, and, and to marry those kind of, that, 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 that breadth, right, of, of all that work and interest, uh, you know, that's what's unique, right, about this place. And so, you know, when, when you give my own background, I, I'm, you know, I barely graduated, really, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, CS program. But it's because I spent all my time, I was an RC, RC grad. I was in residential college. And so I actually did computer science through LSA, which uh, is still <laughs> yeah. funny to me, right? So did, so did I. I mean, that, that, yeah. was, that was awesome. That was the, how you get the <clears> breadth of, <throat> of programs. You don't have to take, like, a bunch of chemistry classes or math classes. You get to take a, a broad Language mix. class. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, that was... And, and so, you know, that, that mix of, uh, of backgrounds, I mean, for me, it was as much of the, um, you know, the <clears throat> background of the humanities that has kind of from, from all the RSA stuff, uh, um, RC stuff, that was is important, right? Thinking about, like, you know, taking all these classes on, like, the theory of revolution or, like, Slavic film or, like, whatever, right? I mean, um, well, you know, we have film directors here at Duo. We think of ourselves as driving a movement, right? Um, a revolution uh, in our own right, right, in terms of how security can and should be done. Um, you know, the, the whole kind of Steve Jobs trope, right, that, that creativity is not ever coming up with a brand new idea out of a whole cloth. It's kind of smashing together ideas from disparate domains <coughs> to, to form some hybrid. Um, I think that's very true, and I think it's something that U of M does particularly well when you've got professors that are across, that are across you know, school of art and design and music and engineering, right? Like that's pretty uh, unbelievable, but that's what this place supports, right? And so, um, so in uh, many other ways, what I'm sure we'll get to, you know, I think you know, a lot of kind of U of M's culture and uh, kind of design has kind of rubbed off on us in a pretty big way uh, for how we built this company, in including the choice to actually keep it here, do it here uh, for those reasons. Certainly the talent too, I mean, the uh, majority of our I don't even know the, the stats, but so many of our first hires were U of M alumni and, um, I mean, Arbor alumni, just part of that, that network of people that we had, we had worked with in some way before. Actually, mm -hmm. our first full-time hire, first full-time uh, non-founding hire, because Adam Goodman was actually our, our third co-founder that joined the company about a, a month after we founded it, yeah. um, was a fellow, Tom Haynes, who came from the, the SI, um, School of Information, HCI program. Yeah, but both of those guys worked with me at Zatu, and Adam had worked with me before, after that at Barracuda, so I kind of, you know, brought him along with, but, uh, but Tom had, uh, had been an, our, our student intern at, at, at Zatu, and, uh, you know, it's just a great community, right, where, you know, um, if you look at, the, there's one thing that I, I don't think the, the engineering community here uh, participates in enough, which is um, the, the super early stage startup community represented by the Ann Arbor New Tech Meetup. So it's a meetup of about 6,000 members, but it's, uh, it meets every month. It has done so for the last eight years. <clears throat> every month there's five new companies present for about five minutes with five minutes Q&A, and it's, it's very lightweight, kind of informal 
thing, but then it kind of concludes with typically three hours of networking at Pizza House. And, um, you know, if you kind of tally it up, it's been hundreds uh, of companies, thousands of founders, <clears throat> and there's a broader community of, of, of interest, right? Um, folks doing this stuff. And, um, you know, when we started, we started in kind of a, a little bit of a physical hub or around some of that community called the Tech Brewery, right? Which there were a bunch of other companies there um, that were growing. Some of them were succeeding. Some of them were failing, but some of them were re recombining, right? And, and that's, that's where we did draw some of our you know, other folks from um, as well. You know, John had also mentioned Craig Labovitz. Uh, Dr. Craig Labovitz, I always make sure that uh, <laughs> Dr. John as well, but you okay. know, if you've, you've done it, you've earned it, right? <laughs> but Dr. Craig Labovitz, uh, you know, he, he was actually hanging out at Microsoft Research <clears throat> when we went and tried to pull him back in, in just, you know, as we are starting Arbor. And Craig uh, joined us for, the, for kind of exactly the same reasons, right? He's like, I can't get anything built. It's like, I'm doing all this great research and like nothing's actually being done with it. Like, this sucks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like, I need to put my ideas into practice because his prior experience was, you know, he, he did his PhD and also pretty interesting and, and very pract to practical effect. I mean, he, he was part of the team that built the NSFnet, which, is, which truly was the first commercial backbone for the internet that we built here as a project of the state of Michigan, ANS, IBM, and MCI. Again, I don't think we ever get much credit for her. Everyone remembers, oh, ARPANET, sure. But ARPANET was basically TCP IP. There were a ton of all the actual protocols that built what we actually use, right, on the internet and the actual network and the actual governance and, you know, <laughs> all the stuff that all came out of Ann Arbor. And again, I just don't think uh, we, we ever get as much credit for that. But that's you know, that's sort of the, uh, Craig started a company after Arbor called Deep Field Networks that also started alongside us. He was the next table. Yeah, right literally across I could like reach at him. A, at the tech brewery. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, you know, that, the, 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 how tightly knit this community is and how easy it is to sort of find folks doing this stuff um, and how willing people are to kind of join in, you know, to new initiatives, new ideas, um, um, and open to all this stuff, you know, is, is, is truly what makes this space special. So on that <clears throat> on the idea of uh, well, of that on that idea of smashing ideas together, mm -hmm. which is obviously a, a key thing. Um, if you go back to 20, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. obviously um, security, it's not it's it's out there. We it's it's been uh, it's been done at that stage. But uh, I think just for a, a, a kind of a lay audience, what mm -hmm. you could do was identify like a niche that hadn't been fully uh, investigated and fully helped in terms of. I'd say, I'd say no. it had been, uh, <clears throat> it was, it had been in, deeply investigated. No, yeah. I, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of helping um, the little guy, the small yeah. companies, well, the big guys. Th this is the impression I get, maybe yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. The, the impression I get is yeah. that, the, and this is, rec this is history retrospect, obviously, sure, sure. make things simple. That the big companies, they, uh, they understood it, they were, they, they were fine with it. The smaller companies, they couldn't necessarily even afford to have, they might have uh, appreciated the need, but they couldn't afford to, um, you know, to, to implement those solutions. Security basically hadn't, hadn't evolved, yeah. right? And, and it was kind of stuck in a, in a, in a it was, you know, the, the network and IT and all this stuff had evolved, and, and our use of technology had evolved in a massive way, right? Like when we started Duo, we started, and it was called Sio. Um, I still had a razor, like a razor flip phone, right? And I was like, John, I'm never gonna, you know, Jono had a smartphone. I'm never gonna get a smartphone. I'm never gonna get a smartphone. I don't trust it. Lo and behold, you know, we're all using smartphones today. Um, and they're all listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't trust them. No, that's not true. I actually trust them a lot more now that our friends are actually the ones putting all the security <laughs> in them, in both Apple and Google, actually. But, um, but any rate, you know, security hadn't kept up. Right, and what we saw was, uh, you know, we weren't prescient, we, we just understand the, the field, right? We saw the shift of attackers changing their, their MO, right? Instead of going after systems, going after users to break into their organizations. And we realized that this is going to, you know, require a very different kind of approach where we'd have to design security for users. Right? If, if security was gonna be something that, you know, every organization could achieve, um, we'd have to, have to make it accessible um, and usable, and, uh, and that would take a, a very different program that I think security engineering had ever really taken before. So the, the, the what that we were doing wasn't new. Mm -hmm. And you guys had the, you might have been at U of M when they had the M tokens, the RSA little fobs that read out a piece of hardware and it reads out six digits. If you had any access to administrative systems at DSC, you would have had yeah. to use one. Yeah. 
And that, that was exactly <laughs> the problem. I mean, that, that technology was meant in 1985, and it, it really hadn't changed. And that was the, the state of how to do uh, multi-factor authentication. And we looked at that and we said, that's the right solution. We're solving the right problem, but how it's, how it's executed, how it's implemented, how it's delivered um, to the end user is what's completely wrong with it. So it, it, you're, you're correct that you know, small organizations just weren't equipped um, to be able to, to provide those solutions to their users to protect their organization. And attackers going downstream were taking advantage of that, going after small and medium-sized businesses. But it was also the big guys. The big guys like, like uh, U of M would deploy those tokens, but only to small populations of users, mm -hmm. which is maybe why you guys didn't use one, because it was only for privilege access to you know, the most important um, IT systems. And so it was not only a, you know, we talk about democratizing security, it's not only bringing it to more organizations, but it's bringing it to more users and use cases, even in large organizations. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and so you know, part of the, what, what, what I did later after uh, I graduated, I worked at a computer security research lab here called the University of Michigan uh, Center for Technology, Center for Integration, oh, what city, CITI, <laughs> Center for Information Technology Integration. City was the home of a lot of very interesting security research and a lot of kind of fundamental network and protocol design. Um, for instance, you know, Tim Howes, right, he's the inventor of LDAP, right, kind of all the directory protocols we use today, who later went on to go build all these companies with uh, folks like Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. Um, but, uh, but at City, one of the things I, I did was a, a penetration test on, uh, on behalf of Dr. Peter Honeyman, um, who used to run that, run that lab, and uh, where I captured the, the pastors, about 3,000 folks at university, but including all the regents, including basically everyone out of the uh, Fleming Administration Building, and again, you know, you saw is that security was never applied evenly, right? That uh, there were many more exposed attack surfaces, right, for, for, for organizations that, that really had to do with people. And as mobility, the internet, email, social media exposed everybody, um, organizations really struggled with how do you actually cover those gaps and, um, you know, stop those kind of attacks. That was our early customer conversations where you know, there was existing solutions deployed, um, like, like RSA, and customers were actually saying, we're not only, we're only not gonna not expand this further, but we're thinking about taking it out because it's so painful, it's so costly, users are up in arms about it. And, you know, our, our perspective was like, well, of course, that's the right solution, but it wasn't until we had those conversations where we said, like, this is really, like, this is, the exact opposite of what needs to happen in the security industry, given all the changes in technology. This is a worthy problem to solve. Um, we can address a huge market. We can uh, you know, really solve the, some of the most fundamental problems in computer security, not some you know, esoteric, tip of the pyramid type problems. Yeah, so the problem we were actually solving was not a specific problem in security, but the problem of security and its non-consumption. And the fact that you know, so many folks just couldn't actually ever you know, approach it. Um, just, just like Apple was not the first company to invent the uh, MP3 player or the computer or the phone, <laughs> but they basically own that today because they've taken, again, a very different approach to how they've made that something that is universally accessible, right? Uh, and something that's a, a truly a joy, right, to use. Um, and, and we've had that same goal. If you think about what Duo sort of stands for, you know, the green versus all the red and sort of black, that you see in our industry, um, we sell not on fear, right, but on a promise of, of, of trust, of how do we help build trust so organizations and people can do what they're supposed to do uh, and not have to worry about all this stuff, right? And, um, and if there is a duality, right, to our business, it is the, the intersection of security and usability, which everyone thinks are diametri diametrically opposed. You know, security is about saying no, usability, usability is about saying yes. But in point of fact, we think that actually both security and usability engineering are just two sides of the same coin, which are about making sure that only the right things happen. And that is an engineering problem to solve. And so that's, <clears throat> that's sort of the way that we sort of approached uh, kind of the, the meta problem with security in, in this business. There were so many, just the industry was just, um, it's a very negative industry. You know, it's very much a very uh, defeatist of like, you know, it's not a matter of if you're going to get breached, but when, and all the scare tactics that are used, and uh, we just wanted to build not only a different product but a different company to to address our, our customers. So it really was a um, for a lot of organizations that we serve a, a breath of fresh air. The way we 
marketed to them and sold to them and treated them as a as a partner. Um, one of the the examples that we, we commonly use is, you know, if a, a company gets breached and it's in the headlines, if you're a security company, what do you do? Most people will pick up the phone, sales reps will pick up the phone, call that CISO, that security leader, and say, you did a bad job, here's if you bought my product, you could have done a better job, buy my product. And if you think about what that person needs in that moment when their name's in the headlines and they've had a breach, that is 100% the wrong thing to do. And, but it's an it's a ambulance chase, it's a common reaction. And uh, what, what our team uh, does is they'll, they'll send some pizzas and like some five hour energy uh, to that customer, that, that organization around lunchtime and say, like, please give this to their security team. We know what they need right now is fuel. Yeah. They, need some, they need some empathy and they need some fuel. And that's something that we've kind of baked into the, the organization as a whole is, is deeply understanding our, our customers' needs and having that, um, that, that empathy to help them, no matter you know, what, um, what they're going through or what part of our organization is interfacing with them. Yeah, we, we, we reject the cynicism right, of, of our industry. In fact, I, I, I tried to leave this industry once. You know, I went to go to this other company called Zatu with another uh, U of M team that was a tech transfer team doing internet TV, which is maybe even a, a worse idea than <laughs> trying to compete against YouTube, but. It's still a company, right, in Sweden? Yeah, Switzerland, yeah, they're yeah. still going, yeah. And, and actually I learned quite a lot from them. It was, it was great, um, great experience for, for us. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was just a challenge, right? You know, obviously, you know, YouTube, um, it, we built some tremendously sophisticated and wonderful technology around self-organizing, application, application layer, multicast video distribution, right? So rather than kind of doing all these unicast streams to flood everyone's networks for the same content, if you had, you know, like a thousand people watching the same, you know, World Cup, you know, broadcast um, on, on, a, on a single network, well, there'd be one stream that'd be, you know, distributed all of your peer-to-peer. And uh, given, you know, prior history, I had done this thing in between where um, a part, hacking crew that's been written up, I was part of called WooWoo, where a bunch of, our, bunch of our members have been pretty famous. Like my friend Jan was the CEO, founder of WhatsApp. My friend John Fanning was the founder of Napster. Um, if you read the Napster book, you'll hear a little bit of the, my history in U of M there. But anyway, I never joined the company because there's no business model around it. But I loved the, the technology. It was an heritage of a lot of things we built here in terms of network protocol design. But anyway, it was just something that felt like if there's a real business model apply, we could do that safely and, and productively. And so I joined that company. But in part, it was reaction also to the fact that security had become a lemon market. By the time that <clears throat> you know, John and I, that I was finishing up kind of with, with Arbor, um, I just got really disillusioned, right, with the fact that in security, you know, people buy these products. You know, a vendor sells you a box, you put it in your network, it sits there, it does nothing, and the vendor says, see, you're more secure, nothing's happening. And of course, like you're the customer, you know, they're like, well, nothing was happening before you put the damn box in, in the network, right? What, what did I really buy here? And so, you know, in security, it's, it's hard that the, you know, uh, disproving a negative, right, like selling nothing, right? <laughs> and that's, that's the thing, like in, in a CISO's career, the best thing to happen on their watch is that nothing happens, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing, but proving ROI, right, is really hard. And because of that, looking, uh, trying to understand the efficacy, right, what actually works in security is very hard for people to understand, much less measure. And so, you know, I left because I'd gotten so disgusted with how much snake oil, right, in, in this industry was actually being successful, how cynical the industry had become, and how disadvantaged, right, you know, customers were um, in, in any of this. And so I went to go do this other thing. We came back to start this company because when we started to see the, the, the targeted attacks, user targeted attacks against smaller organizations and the fact that there's a whole world of um, most organizations around the world that were you know, pretty strictly defenseless, we knew we had to do something and, and throw our hat back in, um, and, and you know, get involved in the fight. And so, uh, so that really was why, why you know, we, we, we needed to go do that. The other part was that I'd also joined Barracuda after Zatu and I'd seen that actually there was the opportunity to build security in a way that could reach many more folks than it ever had. And, um, but we, we just wanted to pioneer, uh, do a little bit more in terms of uh, a disruptive business model as well as a disruptive technology platform, cloud and mobile, um, maybe than Barracuda had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> where do you think the next battlefield might be for you guys and Duo? Next battlefield? 
Yeah, I mean, um, we, you talked about how you recognised, mm-hmm. you know, things were changing uh, 2009, 2010. Yeah, and yeah. The mm-hmm. community was changing its strategy. Has, has, are they changing again? I mean, is there anything oh, that you can, are you trying to keep well, ahead of? Well, you, I, well, I think attackers always do, but those kind of things are kind of tactical. I, I think the thing that I'm, I'm particularly most excited about and the, the, the fight that we have linked up with Cisco, right, to go and, and, and pursue is to basically fix this industry. And so, you know, that, that, the, the reasons the I left, industry. yeah, the yeah. security industry, you know, if you consider that basically there's not even a single vendor, like Cisco is actually the largest enterprise security vendor in the world, and there are no security vendors out there that actually have even a double digit market share. That's how fragmented this industry is. There are thousands of vendors out there that a, a customer has to figure out you know, <laughs> what they're looking at, and yeah. they're being just assaulted with all this crazy messaging and all this FUD and, and so, you know, uh, our goal here in, in working with Cisco is to just clean it up and really, you know, do our best to help, you know, not only lead and set a different kind of example, um, but also maybe even reshape what's happening, right? Um, and, uh, and that's something that I think we're, we're, we're very excited about. I think we, we can have much broader uh, impact, right, as part of this, uh, this larger organization, right? Doing this. Um, so, maybe this is a question for both of you, but I think Doug is the most vocal about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, early on, Duo was sort of categorized as the underdog and as being, a, you know, a punk mm-hmm. company, especially by you. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, um, well, well, I just think I, I, this may be stage specific. I think of startups as being the sure. punk rock absolutely, of business. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. But. Um, was it like to be the man, or is it? <laughs> that is the question I was going to ask. Yeah, I think, I think, I think we still have that, that same mentality, though. You know, right. there, there's, there's, a, there's always bigger fish to fry. You know, there's a, a much larger opportunity to go after in the security mm-hmm. industry, which is not just, you know, creating commercial success for, for Duo and Cisco, but to really uh, change the way people are thinking about their, their security programs. That's the... I think the bigger battlefield is how much technology has changed in the past decade, but how much it will continue to change. And instead of trying to design security that's just keeping up with that, being able to deliver something to to our customers that really does, um, it's not your traditional kind of security approach of of saying no or getting in the user's way, but actually enabling organizations to, to make that transformation in new technologies. Yeah, so, so, so in security, you know, there's absolutely kind of our existing plans to disrupt and how that kind of gets accelerated with Cisco and, and the rest. But in point of fact, you know, the larger opportunity for disruption, industry-wide disruption that we, we consider with Cisco is actually even beyond just security. And the fact that what we represent and in Cisco's own transformation you know, Chuck, their CEO, is a relatively new CEO. He's kind of two years in the seat. He's changed out almost all of his leadership team, yeah. right? You've probably read some articles in the New York Times, about 12 or 13 of his ELT, now it looks like leadership team turning over. And, and he is kind of pursuing the journey that Satya at Microsoft just did three, four years ago, taking the company to the cloud and making it a modern software and subscription business, right? And in the service of doing that, they have the opportunity. Cisco, we have that opportunity now with Cisco, which has been for decades one of the world's most ethical companies, truly to set a different standard for technology. Because I think that's one of the other things that we see this massive opportunity to, to have an impact in. Um, as a small company, I mean, we, we, people always kind of called out that, you know, Duo was different, right? We, we behave differently, we, um, uh, we represent something different. 70, 70 NPS score, right, by its customers, partners, but also employees, right? Um, top rated uh, across all these in, in terms of um, loyalty and satisfaction. But I think, um, you know, when you consider also even the demographics, what Duo looks like, most of our, our team doesn't come from security. You know, nearly 40% of our team are women and under, underrepresented minority. Um, we, while we have been in Michigan and recruiting heavily from U of M, it's not only been that, we've recruited from more broadly across the Rust Belt, from down south, um, you know, Georgia Tech, um, got our, one of our lead, you know, data folks over on the uh, lab side is from Florida, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we, we're kind of stretched to a bunch of places where I, I don't think tech companies do or have in ways that they don't. And, and that's something that I think we, 
we really want to help set a, a, a better example for her because we share investors and board members with companies like Uber. And I remember when um, our board member, uh, Matt Kohler, had fired Travis, you know, there was this question that came to us, like, hey, how do we feel about a board member that would fire their CEO? And I said, well, I couldn't be prouder that around our table, we have the kind of investors who understand that there are more ways than one that a company can fail. It's not just financial, but can also be moral and ethical. And, you know, I think at this moment in time, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, we have been able to kind of pair our agenda with a company like Cisco that's been leading that charge for such a time and we can help accelerate, you know, I couldn't be prouder of. So I, I'm very excited to see what, you know, what becomes of, of all this, not, not just Cisco and Duo, but of the industry, right, as, uh, as all this transforms um, in this, at this time, this particular cultural moment, right? Um, Right. So, um, <clears throat> this cultural moment for you or for in society, and it is exciting to, to see the next batch of um, you know even even a few years ago of security companies starting up and saying we want to follow Duo's blueprint, not just in terms of like the success and growth of the company, but in terms of how we operate. And that's that's what we that's what we set out to do is to, to change the security industry, not just from what we deliver, but how we go about it and how we, we behave. Yeah, and so again, like, we, you know, though, though it, we've clearly differentiated and disrupted in terms of our, our technology, right, and, and what we've pioneered and innovated, we've innovated in many ways sort of across the business, and that's really been our goal, right, that we, we've also pursued a sort of uniform excellence across our business in marketing, in sales, and customer success, and, and how we actually operate, um, you know, is, is, is as important as what we do. Hey, before you go, please subscribe to Reengineering Radio from the University of Michigan Engineering and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. Help us beat the algorithm next month when we meet some of the researchers involved with the Parker Solar Probe, the first instrument to capture